on the other side of toxic Christianity, I found myself faced with one question. Now what? This podcast is about that question. We have conversations with folks who are asking themselves the same things. We're picking up the pieces of a fractured and fragmented faith. We're finding treasure in what the church called trash, beauty, and solidarity in people and places we were told to fear, reject, and dismiss. I'm Tammy Spencer Helms, and this is Life After Leaven. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to this episode of Life After Leaven. I'm your host, Tammy Spencer Helms, and I'm joined by Kay Marshall Green. Hey. Um, that I met at the BTAC conference in Dallas, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I just want to welcome you and invite you onto the show and have you introduce yourself to our listeners. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's already been really great knowing you. I'm excited to see um, what you and I build together because I see I see that um, okay. for us. Yeah, for sure. Um, but my name is Marshall Green. I use pr- pronouns he or they. I am a Black queer feminist. I'm a writer. I'm a professor of Africana studies. Um, primarily, I do like film and visual culture stuff, but I teach classes like Afrofuturism, Black masculinity, um, one of my favorite classes. Well, I just talk Black trans studies but I'm going to be teaching, and this is what I want to talk to you about next year, because yeah. um, I'm moving to, I've, I've been at Williams College for the last five years, but I'm, I'm going to the University of Delaware next year, Nice Africana yeah. Studies, and I'm I'm going to propose, not this year, but the following year, to teach two new classes. One is going to be on the history of Black gospel and church um, in the U.S., Mm-hmm. And other one's gonna be on the history of black stand up, history. Hey. Of the I love stand up comedy. So, oh my gosh, me yeah. too. I really do. We just watched. What were we just watching? Oh, uh, Netflix just did like a mashup joint, and um, oh yeah, uh, we saw the cat with <laughs> Cat Williams one, and there was another one on there, and I was like, these are hilarious. I've been watching a lot. I want to watch that. <laughs> yeah, so it's called like Best of the Best 2023 or something like that, and it's on Netflix. It's like like snippets from all the ones that you know have happened th- throughout the year for Netflix is a joke. And uh, they like kind of picked all the best kind of snippets from each person's stand up and put them in a mashup. It was really funny. Did you see uh, Monique's? No, I haven't. Is it good? Oh, I think it's quite powerful. You got to oh, see yeah? what talk about okay. it on the show. Okay. Really, because she deals with some really deep stuff. And good. I think it's really interesting. There's so many cis Black men who hate it. Mm-hmm. I, they're like, I don't want to see all that pain. And I was like, but it's not just pain. She's actually quite brilliant at bringing something that's really heavy mm-hmm. and then takes you to that point and then Pretty makes it fun. Yeah. Do some release. Um, See, but that's what comedians are supposed to do, I think. Yeah, you know what I mean? I, I think it's beautiful. Uh, she talks about her own queerness, mm-hmm. um, which is wild. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you this. What, like, if you could describe your life before and after you, what I call unleavened, which is just to remove the toxicity out of the way that you love, know, and follow God, how would you describe the two, the before and the after? Well, here's the thing. I wouldn't put a before and after because Mm -hmm. I'm constantly having to face the toxicity of everything that I was brought up with, whether it be like anti-blackness, transphobia, homophobia, Mm -hmm. all these things that I learned through Christianity, but also outside of Christianity too, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, Christians aren't the only homophobes. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And so like, I I grew up uh, Kojic Mm -hmm. for the most part. And you know, Kojic is like real deep, Mm -hmm. Um, real deep. So I used to go door to door Mm-hmm. Ask people, you know, do you want to take Jesus into your heart? You know, I went to church, you know, like uh, Tuesday Bible study, wow. Friday, Friday night service, Thursday <laughs> choir rehearsal, Wednesday, and then Sunday school, and then vac- Sunday vacation Bible school. Um, and then it was like, you know, they give you us, I went to a, one of the bigger, ch- biggest churches in Oakland, yeah. and they 
we we went to that church because they actually had um a recovery program and my dad was an addict okay um, and so my mom wanted to have a place that had a ministry that could hold him yeah and actually was pretty powerful for him Good. Um, and my grandmother is actually who got us started going there um, oh wow okay so uh it's called it was called it's called actual gospel it's still one of the biggest churches if you go in oakland in deep east oakland you'll see people have little bumper stickers to say like actual gospel and (laughs) you know they got shit all over oakland um (laughs) but um you know they would give us a sign it's like you gotta get seven people this week and you know i was talking to somebody last week and i was like I understand why I got bullied. I was always asking my friends if they want to take Jesus oh into their heart. <laughs> I was like, if this nigga don't stop talking about taking Jesus into my fucking heart. <laughs> so like what what changed for you? Like what gave you the the shift in your thinking to be like, I'm about to just move away from this? Like what was the cause of that? You know, I think God is funny. Yeah. Because God will if you're a stubborn so i'm an aquarius Mm -hmm. which is an a fixed air sign Mm -hmm. a fixed air sign so that gives us some taurus qualities Mm -hmm. um taurians are different because they want to control all of the environment Uh aquarians we need our own you can give me a little square like this Mm -hmm. and don't touch nothing in this little square and i can do whatever the hell i want in this square and i'm (laughs) good I'm not going to control nothing. Anybody, I don't have to control anything anyone else does. Yeah. In my little square. Mm -hmm. But like, okay, see, I go on tangents and I get lost. What what was the point? (laughs) No, I was asking you like, what, what moment did you face where you felt like, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Stay in that. So God is funny. So everything I hated. Yeah. I became. Mm. I grew up, like I said, in a very, just because you say something is very Christian doesn't necessarily mean it's homophobic, Mm -hmm. but the way I grew up was Christian and homophobic Mm -hmm. to the point of like me and my big cousins would like, this was like in the days of AOL and AIM instant messenger, we would go into gay chat rooms and like call people faggots and like all this shit. Um, And then I had this, I have this wild education, no biography, but part of it was that I moved from this, I got moved from a public school to this private school in Oakland to play basketball because I've been this height since I was 12. Okay. Um, and I had a coach who was like dying to coach me. Mm-hmm. And um, once I got there, I learned that you couldn't just call people faggots. Mm. He, he, so he was like one of the few black people at this. I was also their test pilot. What happens if you take a poor black kid and put them in this environment? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. And there was two of us. They called us the Twin Towers. Um, (laughs) Wait a minute. So you were a project? (laughs) Yeah. Aren't we all though? um, Black in America? Some ways. It is a project. (laughs) You write about that now. (laughs) It's all, it's all science fiction, you know? Uh, Wow. Um, And so he's coaching me and he pulls me to his office and he's like oh because I was saying this is what I said this is horrible and I because I was talking to my friend I had three best friends two of them were black and one was white um and I used to call her a faggot all the time and I was in love with her I didn't know Mm -hmm. um and I um my coach told me her overheard me saying that and then, you know, I was talking to them and I was just saying, you know, yeah, like I would hate to have a gay kid because it would suck because, you know, then they would have to die because, mm. you know, you can't have gay kids. Mm. Like it would just be so sad. And so wow. my coach pulled me into his office and he's, you know, he's like this big black guy. Funny, funny thing is, is he's actually, you know, Zendaya? Yeah. It's actually her dad. That's my oh, coach. Wow. And like, I grew up with Zendaya, like his, wow. his wife. So Zendaya's mother was my public school teacher. And she's wow. the one who connected me to her husband. Cause my public school wasn't shit. We didn't have sports. We didn't have athletics. Mm. And she started the first um, basketball team. Wow. I this love basketball. Fun. 
Yeah, yeah. She was a white Ooh. woman. So she's a white woman, but she was like six eight. And mm-hmm. then uh Ajamu, that's Zendaya's dad, mm-hmm. he's about six nine. Mm-hmm. And they just wore sweatsuits and Jordans. <laughs> and like yes. they would so before I even went to the private school, Miss Stormers and Zendaya's mom and dad, every year they would take us in the public school, um, camping. In the mm. woods. And our parents would bring like food for the week and they would take all these like 30 black kids. We had never been nowhere to mm. the woods every single year. So they were some bomb ass teachers, right? Yes. <laughs> so she started this basketball team. I tried out for the basketball team. We ain't never had no sports. So everybody want to play. I never knew how to play basketball because we never had sports. I just wow. loved it. So we're like, she was like, yeah, you're not going to make the team. I went home and I was crying. My mom (laughs) called the school angry. How embarrassing. Why did my kid make the basketball team? (laughs) Your kid's not good at basketball. Sorry. (laughs) I was all depressed. And then the stormer brought me in and she was like, look, I know you really want to play, but the thing is, you just, you don't know how to play. And it's not your fault. You just, you nobody ever taught you but you're really tall you know <laughs> like I literally it have, pokes up. <laughs> I've been this size since I was like it's a wild thing because I feel like I'm just now getting into my body but to be 12 and to be 5 10 and a half mm-hmm. you know it, if you know you if you see people who've grown up tall like I remember one of the first people I caught in college was this black dude named Rob Bland and he was he's like six nine or something oh but we walk like this because we were so because we've been so tall and we're used to being around people that are smaller than us and we yeah. want to fit in so we hunch ourselves over because that's how we've been conditioned because mm. it, it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing to think that's about spiritual metaphor <laughs> yeah so anyways um she was she pulled me in into the classroom and she said this Miss Stormer she was like look my husband is a coach and he wants to coach you mm-hmm. and you can play with him if you go to this private school mm-hmm. and they have a really good academics and I know that like that would be good for you because basically I always tell everyone if I had stayed in public school in Oakland it would be really fucked up because I could have been that doing the best that I could be and I would never have been able to compete with those kids at that private school Mm -hmm. um ever um because once we got there it was shit that I ain't never seen before I was like y'all got you can play rock music jazz music gospel music you got a swim swimming pool you got you just have so dance class Mm. you know just like all futons in the classroom you could just be like, yeah, I'm not feeling it today. Oh, you want to go sit out on the tree chair? Oh, my God. Are you serious? <laughs> and, you know, these are the kind of things that you actually, actually, all the people that I was in public school with needed. And I, I thought about this, too, when I, 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 someday we'll have a longer conversation. But mm-hmm. eventually I ended up in a boarding school in New England and Wellesley, mm-hmm. an all-girls boarding school. Mm-hmm. And one thing that at the boarding school is that you had three mental health days per trimester and you just call your house parent and you say hey I want to take my mental health day they call everybody and let everybody know you're not going to be on campus you can go to Boston you can go do whatever you want and I was like this is what I needed when I was in public school this is what we all needed and because people had some tra- I'm I'm just learning now about some of the kids I went to elementary school with and the mm-hmm. trauma that we were we would walk to school together and it's like you watched your father your stepfather murder your father mm-hmm. and we never talked about that we walked to school every single day mm-hmm. um and it was like you know and I got trauma that I'm carrying and we never talked about it we mm-hmm. just talked about bone thugs and harmony and <laughs> like low rider bikes (laughs) (laughs) so when you think about like the trend like the transition to being more fully who you are what catapulted that was it a moment an event so this is what I was saying that God is funny because everything I hated so I was so homophobic right Mm -hmm. and then it was like Oh God, you might be kind of funny yourself. Yes. <laughs> and then I had to contend with, well, 
I, if that's me and I am of God, then I gotta, I gotta do some work. And then the other thing was as a, I identified as a stud for a long time. Mm -hmm. I didn't transition. Help us understand what that is. Cause some people don't know what that is. A stud is a, a, a way of saying like a masculine identified lesbian, a person. And so there's a whole culture stud is usually identify it's more of a west coast term and definitely a black and brown term um usually in the white community they use words like butch or you know yeah. mask and stuff like that yeah exactly and so i grew up with studs um that's one thing that's interesting about the trans like my like my i have trans kids or whatever mm -hmm. my sons and it's like they didn't go through a lesbian mm. they just were trans and I'm like, oh, I had to, you I, had, to I had a huge lesbian, black lesbian community and family. Mm -hmm. I still do in a way, but it's different, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think when, so as a person who identified as a stud and, and I was really caught up in the binary, right? Because the reason I became a stud was because my first date was with a stud mm. and I didn't like the way that that felt. So I was like, oh, what do I got to do? Mm -hmm. to make sure I don't get that energy again and mm -hmm. it was like I have to be that <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so the thing is like I was very transphobic mm -hmm. um even as a as a identif self-identifying like masculine lesbian mm -hmm. I was very transphobic and I used the logic this is why you understand like oh people can make sense of anything anyway my logic was the problem is people don't understand that you can be masculine and feminine and be any gender and like hold those energies. Mm -hmm. And, but then I took it too far. And I was like, the problem is trans women and trans men are just trying to be in a binary and they don't understand that they're just like part of the problem. Mm. So what but shifted that, your thinking on that? I think, like I said, everything I hate, I become. So then it was like, damn, you you might be trans yourself. Mm. Um, and I was like, no, I can't be trans. I don't want to be that. I think that's ugly. I think that's nasty. I think that's weird. I think that's gross. I think that's this. I think that's this. How can that be me? How can that be love? Right. Um, how can that be loved? Right. Um, how right. can I be loved like that? Um, mm. And I think... So to make a long story short, the heart of the matter is something really serious had to shift in my theology and two things, two major things shifted. And I've never been to divinity school, though I've applied and gotten in and gotten scared and felt like I want to do it. And then I just get scared. <laughs> and so I just keep playing that game until something else happens. <laughs> um, but uh, so the first thing that shifted is the way I grew up, it was always like, you know, um, God, thank you so much. I'm such a, you know, horrible person. And where would I be without you? I'm nothing without God. God is my saving grace. I would be nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Yeah. I am nothing. But the truth of the matter is, if God is in me and I am always carrying that divine, then how can I be nothing? Come on, somebody. I'm always something. Mm-hmm. So I had to shift that. And mm -hmm. that's, that, you know, we talk, about, it, it's in our gospel music. It's everywhere. God, I'm nothing without you. Yep. It's I can, true. but it's, you cannot be without God. <laughs> you can't be nothing without God. And the only way to be nothing is to be without God. And no one and is without it's, God. It's not possible. Exactly. Possible. Yeah. And wow. so that had to shift. And then the other thing that had to shift for me was, when I read the Bible, you know, I, preachers say the word never changes. <laughs> the word never changes. Well, I need a word that changes because mm. I change because time changes. Mm. The students I have change. Like I, I just recently I was teaching intro to women's and genders and sexuality studies, which I hate. I hate queer theory. Mm. Um, <laughs> do. I do. And so <laughs> um teaching this class and this is the first time this happened to me where the students are like 
I just don't really remember the world before gay marriage. So all of these debates that you're talking about, it's so new to me. And I'm just like, what? I never thought about that. <laughs> that for them, wow. gay marriage is just like plain and regular. Like, what are you talking about? So I'm teaching them like all these different debates that were happening around it. And they're like, I didn't know it was a thing. Um, and wow. so... The thing is, we need things to change because time changes. So in order to um, be, in order to make ourselves accessible, like we have to be able to change. Mm. Um, and and part of that is understanding that the Bible is not our only text. And we take, the Bible is stories of people's encounters with the divine. Mm -hmm. And we hold, but we hold the Bible up like this. Mm -hmm. And we don't hold our own stories and our own encounters with the divine in that same esteem. Mm -hmm. So what would happen if I was like, hey, to me, when have you encountered the divine? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was that like? And mm -hmm. that would be red text. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually not red, because red is when Jesus is talking, right? But yeah. I just mean like it'll be quotations. Yeah. Like you like your the book of like your book, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's what makes it so difficult. So I don't know if you've watched if you've watched uh, the documentary on the Bill Gothard and the Duggars and stuff like that, but there's a documentary oh, out there. Yeah, yeah. It's on um it's on Prime, Amazon Prime. It's called okay. Shiny Happy People. And we just finished it. And it's interesting because, you know, I was in white evangelical charismatic spaces. And so encounter with God was talked about all the time. But what you don't, what you don't end up realizing is that some of the things that were stirred up in those places were really just about how we're physiologically made. Like music is supposed to move you and singing together with a large group of people is supposed to make you feel calm. And these types of things are actually physiological that happen in every religion <laughs> that other people experience. And it's not just here, but when you're in that kind of a bubble and you don't know, you think, oh, I'm encountering God. Like I'm encountering whoever they say God is, that's who I'm encountering. No, I do believe I did have encounters with God, but I was I not having encounters with white Jesus. And I think that's like the difference because you leave white Jesus and you have similar things happen, right? You just frame them differently. So I'm I'm curious to know from you, when you heard that it was okay to love yourself and when you heard it was okay for you to kind of like let the text go with you, what was the next step? How did you get from being, you know, at Wellesley to now being Marshall Green? What was that journey like? Um, well, I think part of it is realizing that it's a, it's a journey. So there's okay. always change. So trans means to move, to change, to transform constantly. We think of, honestly, we talk about when we think about trans people, we think, oh, you're moving from one gender to another, but mm -hmm. that's not how it works for me. Like I never can forget what it means to grow up and be a black girl and a black woman mm -hmm. until I was 26 mm -hmm. um, and like I'm not gonna whether people however people see me I'm not gonna forget that history and forget how, mm -hmm. how that that upbringing you know mm -hmm. and I'm not gonna forget what it means to be a woman because I felt it um, mm -hmm. what it means to be a girl mm -hmm. and that's Honestly, we probably have a lot more better men if they knew what that <laughs> experience was like. Yeah. Um, but um, hmm. what, so say say the say the question one more time for me. It's like what the journey was, but I mean, you said something that's got me wanting to ask you a question about. Hmm. I I feel similarly right. Like as I'm leaning into being non-binary and thinking. Um, I, I consider myself a non-binary black woman because the black woman is very important to me. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've lived that experience in this country. I feel like I think like that and I have a lot of honor and respect for that. But at the same time, male or female is are too, um, it's like a tight shoe. Like who I am is restricted by those things. Yeah, so I would rather that. just say, yeah, as trans people, we exceed those things. So I don't hate on how anybody is because everybody has their own journey. Mm -hmm. And a lot of trans people love the binary mm -hmm. because all we've done is work so hard to be this thing and like fit mm -hmm. in the world in this way. Right. And 
gendered properly. So I get Yeah, it's so true because there are conversations we need to have, right? Like within the queer community itself, there are conversations we need to have. There's reconciliation that needs to take place. And a lot of people don't realize that there has been historically, there have been issues with those who identify as lesbian and gay, with those who identify as trans. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because you went from one to the other. Say there's also challenges between those who identify as trans. So I think when we think about LGBT, Mm -hmm. the thing is that trans does not belong because trans people can be lesbian, gay, and bisexual. Mm. Being gay and bisexual are sexualities. That is about what your desire is. Mm -hmm. Gender is about who you desire to be and how you desire to be seen. Interesting, yeah. So there are different things. And so it's interesting that we put those things together. They don't Mm. actually belong Mm. Uh, to me, to me, that's just me. Mm. But uh, I think that like, I have conversations, some conversations I don't even, I'm afraid, like I just had a very interesting conversation with one of my trans kids who I still who I still call my son, but uses she, her pronouns now. So I met this person and they were a teenager. Um, and she, I'll use she, her pronouns. She uses she, her pronouns. But when I met them, they were transitioning to using he, him pronouns. Mm. And that's all I knew them as was like, he, him, my son. Mm-hmm. And then came to a moment where, she was like, you know, I want to lean more into my feminine energy mm-hmm. and I, I want to use she, her pronouns. You can still call me your son, but I want to use she, her pronouns. Mm-hmm. So it was really interesting because then I had to contend with my, with my mother I had to contend with, because I'm like, this is my son, <laughs> but now this is my daughter too. Interesting. I don't really know how to interact with you like that. Like, you want to play basketball or not? <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's trippy because it's like, now I'm the binary comes queer, back up in I'm your the, brain. I'm the queerest person there is. And this is making me mm-hmm. question how, like, and I think that is why we have to shift and change because, like, it make me it makes me understand, like, oh, I'm old school now. Mm. Like, I'm from a different generation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we had a whole discussion because they identify as a non-binary femme. Mm. like you know that's just something I don't really understand Mm -hmm. because it's not that I don't understand it like I can't have compassion and empathy for a person who identifies as that Mm -hmm. but if I take take if I go away from the human and think about logic Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're saying non-binary and Mm -hmm. then you say femme well that's a binary category Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that seems like an oxymoron to me Yes. It's so interesting because I remember saying that to my spouse when we were dating and they, they were talking about how, um, they really didn't identify as a female. They were mostly non-binary or they actually were non-binary. And I didn't know what that meant for me. Right. Because I'm out here. Like, I think I'm just gay. Like, I think I'm, <laughs> like, I don't, but I'm what is that plain regular gay? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, and all of, and it really it was funny. It was like, damn, all these evangelicals, if I had known you were going to transition and be a man, like I could have just been like, I'm with a man and they <laughs> fine. you know, there are all of those thoughts that come and it shows you how much like social construction, how powerful that is. And that, and, and what I love about these conversations that I'm having with people in the queer community is that we're figuring it out too, but it just seems like the gap is shorter, right? Like, you know, I think about we're kind of dealing with our issues and dealing with the the questions we all have and the dissonance, like in real time. It's happening as as we grow together, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas That's before, true. yeah, like before, it's like you look back and you're like, okay, what did we do wrong? And let's fix what happened. But it feels very present. Everything feels very present. And I love that about queerness in general, that there is so much tension and and then it necessitates being present yeah. um, that I think that we can learn a lot from it, you know, in my opinion, for sure. That's so key being present. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of, so I have, if, so the only, I have, I have one article, 
I have multiple articles, but there's an article where I give my proposition of trans with an asterisk mm. um, as a theory. And it is not about a trans being, but trans with an asterisk is, you know, when you put the asterisk sign on something and you're doing a library search, mm -hmm. it gives you like the multiple possibilities that go along with that thing. Mm -hmm. so I think about trans with an asterisk, asterisk as like, the potential to understand how two or more things might potentially meet one another, whether it be in the friction, the conflict, or the like synergy. Mm. And so the article that I kind of like lay this out, I actually start, so this gets back to your other question. Mm. I start out with a story about going to or not going to this Black uh, lesbian retreat that I used to go to regularly in LA and I didn't go because it was post me having top surgery and they said well you can come still but you can't take off your shirt mm. anymore mm. and I was like that doesn't sound right to me that don't feel right to me mm -hmm. um, and yet I understand because y'all are trying to figure it out too mm -hmm. um but it's just funny the kind of policing we do and how we do it on each other's bodies mm -hmm. in order to figure out our own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It just kind of sucks. I, I always I always think about that, like how we work our stuff out on other people's bodies. And it's mm -hmm. just like, sometimes I'll be like, don't work that out on me, baby. <laughs> I don't want that energy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we work out our stuff on other people's bodies. Yeah. That ain't nothing but a word. <laughs> so like what, you know, you, you talked about, you grew up Kojic and it was like <laughs> every day you at every day we church. So I like, <laughs> I still go to church. I love church. That's I what I want to talk to you down about. Down. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's what I want to talk to you about is that was there ever a point where you felt like you had to choose between the two or it just never was a choice for you? No. I mean, the only reason I'm alive is because of my Christian upbringing and because of that faith mm -hmm. and because of one particular ideology that I grew up with that was a Christian base for me, which is like, you can't kill yourself mm. because that's the ultimate sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know it. I don't believe in that. So like I've had, pe I've had a lot of people who have committed suicide in my life mm -hmm. and um, I don't believe that they've gone to hell. I, I don't believe in hell. Actually. Mm -hmm. I'm Carlton. I'm a Carlton Pearson person. <laughs> and so like, um, but I also am a person who is, I'm bipolar. Mm -hmm. um, I've been hospitalized three times um, I have these manic episodes, super high, and then I have, I've always had depression my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. but this manic depression, this bipolar depression mm -hmm. is like, not like anything I've ever experienced. Mm. Because it's not feeling sad, is that you're absent of feeling. Mm. <laughs> and so I wake up every day and it lasts for about a year and a half to two years. <laughs> Wow. Every single day, try to do the things that I know make me feel good, that I love. Feel nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing mm -hmm. moves me. Nothing touches me. I can't listen to music. I love music. I can't play my drum. I love the drum for a year and a half this last time. Um, and honestly, it was like, if I believed that if I didn't have my faith, I would have killed myself. Mm -hmm. I definitely would have, because there was no point for me to wake up every day. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I was doing was thinking, well, God, I know something is going to change because you keep waking me up every day. And I keep being like, I don't know why the fuck I'm here. And this shit sucks. Everything sucks. Mm -hmm. I suck. You suck, like <laughs> we all suck. <laughs> and it's just like, but the and this is why I have so much I have so much gratitude for the ability to feel. Mm -hmm. Because in those moments, what's going on is I can't feel. Mm -hmm. 
can't feel anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I do feel, it's just negative. Mm. Um, And so I think that one, I wasn't diagnosed as bipolar until I was uh, 33, which is very late. Mm -hmm. Um, I grew up with a mother who uh, struggled with mental health stuff. So I watched her and took care of her through many uh, mental health breakdowns and I witnessed it um, and it was my greatest fear. Mm. It was always my greatest fear that something like that would happen to me. Mm-hmm. But I was, you know, way past the age that anything like that should happen. Right. <laughs> that should happen. Um, and it has totally shifted and changed my life. Um, How so? Everything is different. One, it was like, so the first time I had my manic episode, the first manic episode I had um, was here at Williams College. Mm -hmm. The second manic episode I had was in Oakland, where I was from, where I'm from, home. And basically when I was in Oakland, I walked up and down the streets from the lake to the airport, which if you know Oakland, you know it's about eight, nine miles. Mm -hmm all night I just walked back and forth and I went in all kinds of different spaces um Mm. but there was also like when you have manic episodes there's also a very spiritual thing happening too so there in Oakland right now there's more homelessness than I've ever seen or witnessed before in my whole life and that at that moment it was it was fucking with me Mm -hmm. and all these encampments I started walking through the encampments and because I couldn't like take in that this was a reality mm-hmm. made it in my head like oh this is actually an art show and this is an exhibition mm. and I just was walking through you mm. know all these encampments um mm-hmm. talking to people uh, <laughs> uh but you know when you when you're manic it gets then it gets to a point where it's just scary mm-hmm. um and then I got hospitalized and my mom was a person who took care of me as best as she could. It was really interesting. Um, mm-hmm. And that happened, you know, during my Jesus year, 33. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got out of the hospital the day before I turned 34. Mm-hmm. So it felt like a real true death and resurrection. Mm-hmm. Completely rebuild my understanding of myself Mm -hmm. and I had to learn how to love myself again because I felt so disappointed in myself really okay I Mm. felt like I let myself down I mean you because I couldn't control it Mm. nothing you can do um wow and then you know hospitalization is like incarceration the way that they strap you down shoot you up with stuff the last episode I had was in LA and I was in the hospital for a month. Mm. The mm. only thing I remember is the day before I left the hospital. So that freaks me the fuck out. I try not to think about it so much because I'm like, I have no idea what was going. Like anybody could have done anything to me. I, I don't remember. Mm. Wow. Wow. So there is an... Uh... Also that experience, this might, you know, you helping me because this might be another way that God is again showing me myself mm. because going through it it gave me such compassion for my mother in a way that I hadn't had before because I was like oh there's shit that you probably really don't remember Mm. you had this experience and you know it gets to the point where it's like I'm telling my mom what happened and she's like oh yeah I did those same exact movements I did that same exact thing and then you start to think where's this coming from what what ancestor is this Mm. (laughs) Wow. Whew. <laughs> I'm I'm just glad you're still here. I mean, having met you and had the conversations with you, I'm like, yeah, this person is is extremely gifted and such a bright light. I'm just glad that you stayed. I'm glad that you're here. I appreciate that. What would you say if you had to like pick something that you kept with you from before you loved yourself uh was there anything worth keeping 
from like the way that you did God or life in God before you transitioned, before you fully entered into being who you are? Is there anything that you brought with you from the rubble? Yeah, everything. Mm. Everything. Because everything. No one has ever said that. That's everything, everything is constantly with me because I'm constantly changing and transforming, but there are roots mm -hmm. that hold me and ground me. And some of those roots might have some things that are not that great. Mm -hmm. and like I said, the only thing that has kept me here was my faith. Mm -hmm. As toxic as it was, mm. I, I had so many visions of how I was going to kill myself. Wow. And I was like, but I know I'm not going to do it because, you know, that's against God. <laughs> and, as, and as fucked up as that is, it actually saved my life. So I appreciate that boundary being instilled in me. Wow. <laughs> Whoo, that's deep. <laughs> it's 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 making me feel a lot of things because I know that trans kids are killing themselves at alarming rates. And I cannot imagine what it's like to live as though if I if I'm in the misery here, I'm headed for misery there. And I don't know which misery is better that type of existence and to demand that someone live that type of existence from your little comfortable house happy little family you got everything you want in life you got a boo you got a bay you got a house you got god and you mm -hmm. sit across from people who live miserable lives every single day because you are uncomfortable with them just living and that to me feels wrong and it feels wicked so to see someone say you know if it hadn't been for my faith I I wouldn't I would I wouldn't be here that's another beautiful tension to hold right as we have these conversations I mean I'm not I'm not that far into the journey of my own journey with queerness I like came out married the first person <laughs> <laughs> I made it. like it was you know it wasn't my story is very but my story is mine and it will make sense um when it's supposed to make sense and to whom it's supposed to make sense and so yes. that being said I'm yes. gonna ask you two more questions um but I'm gonna start with the third question first if you had to give people some words to live by what would they be perfect you you already segued into it so there's two things one is Audrey Lord there are no new ideas only new ways of making them felt which leads into the second point which is everybody here comes bearing medicine mm. but everybody don't need your medicine mm. but somebody needs your medicine mm. everybody don't need it <laughs> you have to cultivate that medicine in you because there's the people who need it need it mm. And don't get hurt when somebody doesn't need it because it's just not, that's not your ministry. <laughs> but you have a ministry mm. and it's yours. Mm -hmm. mm. So both of those things are what I would, what I would say. Yes. Uh, it makes me think of Amanda Seals who's like, uh, what does her thing say? I'm not for everyone. <laughs> and just being okay with that. I'm not for everyone. <laughs> I mean, you will kill yourself trying to pleasure everybody. Mm-hmm. 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 It's no way to live. Yeah. It's no way to live. All right. What are you binging? Are you watching or listening or reading? Oh, oh my God. I love TV. I'm a TV kid. <laughs> so I am watching Moesha. I'm watching the Parkers. I'm watching Claws. I'm watching Dynasty. Mm. Um, for the third time, um, <laughs> I'm always watching Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Oh my gosh, I like Criminal Intent better. SVU be that be getting to you. It's such a formula though, because you're like, it's not you again. <laughs> like you know, that's not the person. It's only 15 minutes into the show. They didn't solve the case yet. Um, <laughs> you fall for it every time. <laughs> exactly. Um, what else? Uh, I want. Well, now I, I want to see the Little Mermaid. Mm -hmm. um, binging. Oh, music! I just we were talking about earlier. I just went to the Roots Fest and I got 
see my favorites like Lauren Hill, who's my ultimate favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first saw Lauren Hill during the, uh, it's been 25 years since the miseducation, she mm-hmm. said at the concert. Don't say that. Don't say that, Marshall. That made me feel old as hell. And I, I went to the first, I went to the miseducation concert and Buster Rhymes opened for her. And Buster Rhymes surprised guested at the Roots Festival. So it felt like this full circle thing. And then my ultimate favorite rapper, Eve, was there, who's from Philly. So, you know, it was so live. And then Usher, I mean, Usher, (laughs) out like... Usher, baby. He's such an amazing performer. I was just like... And then 60,000 Black people Mm. just being there, just listening and absorbing mary mary was there mm-hmm. maverick city was there i love that's what i've been to i love gospel music mm-hmm. especially this new stuff like pastor mike <laughs> mm-hmm. have you heard pastor mike no i haven't oh i gotta see some stuff i i i, I like that um pastor and I, I like um ty trebet's new latest album um you know it's hard for me to do ty trebet because his earlier stuff was so funky but um <laughs> He's a really amazing composer. Uh, Always a Kirk Franklin fan. I was just about to say, and and then you have to say Kirk. Yes. Yeah, ultimate favorite. Also, Kirk Franklin has always been on the cutting edge when it comes to his way he thinks. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really corny on that album where he does that poem about gay people, Mm -hmm. but it was also really quite beautiful because no one else had ever explicitly said Mm -hmm. love gay people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know? So, yeah. Right. Uh, It has been like such a joy having you. Where can people find you? If they want to follow you, learn from you, where can they find you at? So on all the socials, I'm Dr. Drummer Boy, B-O-I-G, Dr. Drummer Boy G. Um, And I have a website. Uh, If you just look up uh, Marshall Green or the name that uh, my my first name is Kai, my middle name is Marshall, my last name is Green. So I usually go by my middle name now, Marshall. But if you look up Kai Green, you probably find a lot of stuff that way too. Cool. Thank you so much for being on here. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Like I said, I'm looking forward to building. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for listening. To put your money in your heart is donate to Subquatcher Inc. And clear the path for Black students today.